ready to learn shorthand? I know, I know, you thought this was going to be a chemistry lesson, right? Well, it is. You're going to learn chemist shorthand. In the last unit, you learned all about bonding, and you discovered that these bonds produce compounds. You already know that compounds are represented by chemical formulas. Today, you'll find that, like the periodic table, chemical formulas and chemical equations have been designed so that lots of information can be obtained quickly and efficiently. Chemists have identified more than 4 million chemical compounds, which can react in thousands of different ways. So, a uniform system has been devised to represent chemical compounds and chemical equations. Think of this uniform system as the chemist's shorthand. During this lesson, you will learn to write formulas for a variety of ionic compounds. A chemical formula tells us the relative number of atoms of each element in a compound. If the compound is molecular, the chemical formula tells the number of atoms of each element contained in a single molecule. Remember that the atoms in a molecular compound are held together by covalent bonds. If the compound is ionic, the chemical formula represents what is called one formula unit of the compound. When we learned about bonding, you found that only covalent bonding produces molecules. An ionic bond doesn't produce a molecule. So, a formula unit simply means the simplest ratio of an ionic compound's positive ions and its negative ions. Today's lesson will focus on learning how to write the formulas for ionic compounds. But first, we need to review the ionic bond that creates an ionic compound. When we learned about bonding in the last unit, one of the bonds we discussed was the ionic bond. Remember that the ionic bond is simply the attraction that binds oppositely charged ions together. When a metal combines chemically with a non-metal to form an ionic compound, one or more electrons are transferred from each atom of the metal to one or more atoms of the non-metal. Metals tend to give away electrons during the formation of an ionic bond, so they become positively charged cations. Non-metals tend to take or steal electrons during the formation of an ionic bond, becoming negatively charged anions. Remember that this electron transfer occurs so that an atom might obtain a noble gas electron distribution in order to increase stability. So just remember that noble gas notation or distribution is just the lowest, um, like that ground state. Remember, the reason we form compounds is to become more stable. Elements by themselves have higher energy than the compounds that form from them. I hope that all this talk about ionic bonding is ringing a bell. Okay, now that we've reviewed the ionic bond, let's take a closer look at an ionic formula. This particular ionic formula represents aluminum chloride. In addition to the symbols for aluminum and chlorine, subscripts are used to represent the number of each ion in the formula unit. If no subscript follows the symbol of an ion, it is understood that the element in the formula has only one ion. According to this formula, we have one aluminum cation and three chloride anions. In any stable ionic compound, there is no net electrical charge, as the positive and negative charges balance one another out. For instance, a substance such as aluminum chloride must have one unit of aluminum, which has a positive three oxidation number, for every three of chlorine. This produces a net charge of zero for the compound. So this means that, again, compounds are neutral. Neutral means that is neither positive nor negative. The charge is zero. A combination of atoms with either a negative or positive charge will be highly unstable and will continue to react with other substances until forming a stable compound with a net charge of zero. Now, let's put all this information together and find the system scientists use when writing the formula of ionic compounds. As usual, some rules are involved. What else is new? But these rules help keep our system consistent. The first step in writing the formula of an ionic compound is to write the symbols of the elements in the compound. The symbol for the cation, usually a metal, is written first, followed by the symbol for the anion, usually a non-metal. The next step in writing our ionic formula is to determine the charge on each ion. 
We learned in a previous unit how to use the periodic table to determine ionic charge. Okay, so in a different video, they talk about how to find the ionic charge um, of an element based on its location in the periodic table. We've talked about that a little bit. You guys just didn't know that that's what I was covering at the time. What we did talk about is how to find how many valence electrons there are in those representative elements, those that are in group 1 and 2, and then 13 through 18. This is the only place you're going to be able to use this trick, and it is for monatomic ions. Monatomic means that they are the only element that is in that compound, monoatomic, one atom, one type of atom, okay? So group 1 has one valence electron. What was discussed in the video previously is that metals, which is everything from that staircase over here, metals produce positive ions. And remember, we talked about how if I just have one valence electron, it's easier to give that one away and lose that electron to go to the stable full valence electron shell. So the charges in group one are plus one because I lost an electron. Group two, all of these elements, their monatomic ions are going to be plus two ions. So these are going to be cations. They're going to keep their elemental names. Just like in covalent molecules, you use the elemental name for this ion name. But that was when we were on the other side of the periodic table with covalent. Keep the metals names for the cations. We skip the middle because these transition metals give up a different number of electrons depending on what it is they're interacting with. So we're going to talk about oxidation levels and we're going to use Roman numerals to help you figure out the charge of those. But everything in here is also going to have a positive charge. When we get to group 13, which has three valence electrons, it is going to have a plus three charge. 14 is where it switches, right? Because they have four valence electrons. I can either gain or lose. We will not use this family for determining ion charges. When we get to group 15, which has five valence electrons, that's the point where the electrons have banded together and are saying, we don't want to be separated. We want to just add more friends. So here we had a plus three charge this would be a plus or minus four guess what we're going to do here these are going to be all minus threes or negative threes then we have minus two minus one my noble gases since they are stable and have a full valence electron shell with eight electrons are not typically going to form ions remember they do not have electric electronegativity values because they don't like to share, and very rarely will they form compounds. So plus one, plus two, plus a number, plus three, plus or minus four, minus three, minus two, minus one. Finally, select subscripts that will make the total positive charge equal to the total negative charge. Remember that the overall charge of our ionic formula must be zero, which will only happen total positive charge is equal to the total negative charge. Here's an example. Let's write the formula for sodium chloride. You know it as common table salt. Because sodium is in group one of the periodic table, we know that it needs to give away or lose one electron in order to become stable. This will cause the ion to have a positive one charge. Because chlorine is in group 17, we know it needs to steal or gain one electron in order to become stable, causing the chloride ion to have a negative one charge. The two ions making up the compound are sodium with a positive one charge and chloride with a negative one charge. When the charges of the ions, positive one and negative one, are added together, we get zero. Using our rules for writing the formula of an ionic compound, we write the cation, in this case sodium, first. We then write the anion, which in this case is the chloride ion. The formula for sodium chloride is NaCl. One sodium ion and one chloride ion 
together have a net charge of zero. Notice that no ones are written as subscripts. They are merely understood. One more thing to notice. The number precedes the sign. Although we say that the charge on the sodium ion is positive 1, we write the charge as 1 positive. And although we say that the charge on the chloride ion is negative 1, we write the charge as 1 negative. This is the conventional way of writing ion charges. Another so the conventional way of writing ion charges is really nice if you go to a university where they're going to care about things like that. When you get to the middle of the table, those transition elements, it actually switches. So you actually want to write those as like plus a number. Um, in this class, I do not care if you understand those rules. You can put the plus or the minus um, either in front of the number or behind the number. I will read it as the same thing. Another example would be magnesium chloride. Magnesium, which is in group two, is a metal that gives up two electrons to become stable, creating a cation with a positive two charge. As we saw in our first example, chlorine is a nonmetal that gains one electron to become stable, creating an anion with a negative one charge. The number of electrons lost by magnesium is two, creating a positive two charge, while the number of electrons gained by chlorine is one, creating a negative one charge. We would need two chloride ions for every one magnesium ion so that the overall charge of the compound would be zero. So the formula for magnesium chloride is MgCl2. The 2 after the Cl is called a subscript, and it represents the number of chloride ions in the formula. Again, you notice that the subscript of 1 in our formula is understood, but not written. To aid in our writing of ionic formulas, we can use a shortcut called the crisscross method. This is a very easy way for us to balance the positive and negative charges so that the net charge of our formula is zero. Watch as this student uses the crisscross method to determine the formula of an ionic compound. All right, I want you to use the crisscross method to write the formula for the binary ionic compound that forms between barium and iodine. Okay, first I need to write the symbol for the cation and the anion. Right, that's how do you know which is the cation and which is the anion. Barium is a metal, which means it loses electrons, so it's going to be a cation. Then iodine is a nonmetal, which means it gains electrons, so it's going to be an anion. That's right, so now I want you to do that. Write first the symbol of your cation and then the symbol of your anion. Okay. Okay, what do you need to know next? I need to know the charges of the symbols. Since barium is in group two, it's gonna have a positive two charge. Since iodine is in group 17, it's gonna have a negative one charge. Okay, so go ahead and write those charges to the upper right-hand side of your symbols. Okay, and do you know what you need to do next? Now I'm gonna crisscross the charges and make them the subscripts for the ions. Okay, go ahead and do that. Sometimes a mistake teaches us a very important lesson. Do you have any idea what you did wrong here? No, I really don't. I thought I was supposed to take the charges and crisscross them so I could figure out the subscripts for the ion. That's right, except that you have to remember what these subscripts tell us. The subscripts tell us how many we have of each ion. So you really just want to use the absolute value of the charges when you crisscross. Oh, so I don't need the negative or the positive. That's right. Very good. Now, there's actually one more problem with the subscripts. Look at the two subscripts and see if you see what to do. We don't need the one, it's understood. Right, one is always understood. Okay, so we're gonna have just this two as our subscript. Um, there's one more problem. We write the charges when we're writing a formula to help us figure out the subscripts. But when we write the final formula, we actually don't use the charges in okay. the final formula. So we don't need these. All right, we'll take those out. And now you can write the formula for barium iodide. Okay. That's the formula for barium iodide. Great job. Okay, so I add a little extra information in my method. I don't call it the crisscross method. I call it crisscross and drop. So I'm going to back up this video a little bit. All right, thanks to the joys of video editing, we should be on this screen. So the reason I call this the crisscross and drop method is... We make the crisscross just like this, but drop is going to serve two different purposes in the name. So the first job that it's going to do is tell you we're going to drop these instead of them being sub, uh, superscripts. We're going to drop them down to that subscript level. So that's one reason we add drop to the crisscross method. The other thing 
like was stated in the video, we don't want to include these charges. So guess what we're going to do? We're going to drop those too. So when you drop the charge, you keep the number and bring it down as a subscript. You do not keep the signs with the charges. So I don't know if that'll help, but it's something that I have figured out um, is a little extra reminder that we're going to not just crisscross, but also bring those numbers down and lose their charges. Watch what happens when we use the crisscross method to write the formula for calcium sulfide. Calcium has a positive two charge and the sulfide ion has a negative two charge. And you can determine this by using the periodic table or simply looking it up on your charge chart. Now, if we were to crisscross the charges to obtain each ion subscript, we would get Ca2S2. But a correctly written ionic formula is the simplest ratio of the ions present in an ionic compound. So this formula could be simplified to CAS. When writing an ionic formula, if the subscripts are the same, omit them. So the formula will be in the simplest ratio possible. Just what happens when one or even both of the ions in a chemical formula are polyatomic. Writing the chemical formula for ionic compounds containing polyatomic ions such as magnesium nitrate is much like that for writing the formula for other ionic compounds. The magnesium is put down first because of its positive charge and is then followed by the nitrate, which has a negative charge. This negative ion is represented in parentheses next to the positive ion in the typical shorthand used to represent molecules. So when it comes to polyatomic ions, an ion that has more than one capital letter in it, because it has more than one element, there is a list of these that I have not given to my other classes in a normal year. I have had them be something that you memorize. We're going to try it differently this year and see how you do. So the thing to remember with polyatomic ions is that it starts with the letter P. And we're going to use that information to help us remember that if I have a polyatomic ion, I have to protect it with parentheses. So before we worry about right, or doing our crisscross and drop to figure out what subscript we're going to do, um, use, we're going to protect my polyatomic ion with parentheses, and we're going to draw a little fence around it. Be sure to include any subscripts that are already included in that polyatomic ion inside your parentheses. Then you're going to go outside of your protective barrier and put the subscript of the number of that ion you need to create a net charge of zero. So it's going to look funny and it's going to feel funny, but it is very important that before you even worry about um, balancing your charges, you protect that whole polyatomic ion first. This is especially tricky to remember whenever we have polyatomic ions that don't have subscripts. So hydroxide is just OH. It does not have any subscripts with it. It still has to have parentheses, though. We protect all polyatomic ions with parentheses prior to balancing our charge. Example of the formula for sodium nitrate. Using the crisscross method would give subscripts of one for both the sodium ion and the nitrate ion. And what do you do with the ones? Right, omit them when writing subscripts. So this shows that if there is only one of my polyatomic ion, I do not need those parentheses. So it is going to be up to you a little bit to figure out how you want to remember this information. Um, but I tend to think of it as if I have a lot of something in my yard, I want to make sure that I protect it. If I only have one, um, I maybe don't need to have those parentheses, um, that fence around it to protect it. But if I have more than one, I definitely want to keep it safe. So now that we have figured out how to write formulas, now we're going to figure out how to go from formulas to names, which I personally think is much easier to do for ionic compounds. By now, you should be a whiz at writing formulas. In today's lesson, you're going to read formulas in order to know how to name compounds. For instance, how do we know that baking soda, NaHCO3, is known to the chemist as sodium bicarbonate, and that Epsom salt, MgSO4, is actually magnesium sulfate?
During this lesson, you will name both ionic and molecular compounds when given the chemical formula, including some hydrocarbons. I like a little binary ionic compound on my french fries. How about you? It's ordinary table salt, of course. But this is where we'll begin our lesson, by focusing on naming ionic compounds, like this ordinary table salt, a binary ionic compound. Binary ionic compounds in food. Okay, so this video is going to talk about binary and ternary ionic compounds. You do not need to know that distinction. Of only two elements, a metal and a nonmetal. To name them, name the positive ion or the cation first. Usually, that's simply the name of the metal. Then name the negative ion, the anion, which is the name of the nonmetal, with a slight change. The ending of the root word is changed to I-D-E. Some metals can form more than one type of ion. When any of these is in a compound, use a Roman numeral in parentheses after the name of the metal to show the charge of the particular ion. This is called the stock system of nomenclature. After some practice, you'll begin to recognize these metals. The traditional system of nomenclature uses suffixes rather than Roman numerals. But we're going to stick with the stock system in this course when naming ionic compounds. That's what most college courses do. So, there you have it. Pretty simple, don't you think? We'll practice some together, and then your local teacher will help you do some on your own. By now, you probably recognize the chemical formula of ordinary table salt, NaCl. Let's use our rules to determine the chemical name for this compound. First, name the cation, which is sodium, and then name the anion. Cl is the symbol for chlorine, which would be the chloride ion when you change the ending to IDE. According to our rules, the name for ordinary table salt, NaCl, is sodium chloride. Try this one. What is the name of the compound with the chemical formula MgO? If you said magnesium oxide, you're right. I so this is when you have two monatomic ions that are going to go together. Um, that's the term that I will use in class. This is very much exactly the same formula as our covalent molecules. The first one keeps its elements ending. The second one keeps the root and gets the ending IDE instead. I understand how to do the compounds like magnesium oxide and sodium chloride. But what about the stock system and Roman numeral that I heard about? The easiest way to teach you that is to do an example. So we'll write the name for Cu2S. Now, if you look, you'll see that copper can have a positive one charge but it can also have a positive two charge. So we have to figure out whether we're talking about the copper with a plus one or the copper with a plus two. And you want to remember that in an ionic compound, the overall charge has to be zero. So the total positive charge has to equal the total negative charge. Um, I want you to look on the charge chart or on the periodic table and see what the charge is of the sulfide ion. Remember we say sulfide instead of sulfur because when we're talking about an ion, we change the ending to IDE. Okay, the sulfide ion has a, ion has a charge of negative two. Okay. So we have one sulfide ion because there's no subscript here. It's understood to be one. And one times negative two is a negative two. So that means that our overall negative charge is negative two. So our overall positive charge is to be positive two. Now, how many copper ions do I have making up that positive two charge? Since the subscript is two, there are two ions in the copper. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take our overall charge and we're going to divide by the number of atoms, ions, to get the charge on each ion. So 2 divided by 2 is going to give us a positive 1 on each of the copper ions. And you'll notice if you look on the charge sheet, when copper has a charge of plus 1, its name is copper plus 1. So we'll write copper, Roman numeral 1, sulfide. So that'll be the name for Cu2S, copper, Roman numeral 1, sulfide. And the Roman numeral just tells us that it's the plus 1 ion. That's not so hard. Let me try. Okay, let's have you write the name for SNCl4. Okay, well, first of all, I know the overall charge should be zero. But the problem is, I don't know which 10 to use. There is a 10 with a charge of positive 4 and a 10 with a charge of positive 2. Okay, well, what do you think you need to do first? Well, I know that chloride has a negative 1 charge. All right, let's write that in. Okay, so go on. Now I'm going to take the 4 and multiply it by the negative 1, which is negative 4. So the overall charge is going to be negative 4. That means this charge is going to be plus 4. Since there is only one 10, 
the charge of 10 is going to be plus 4. Exactly. So how are you going to write the name? It's going to be 10, Roman numeral 4, chloride. That's right. Just for clarification, these are still separate words. You do leave a space. Um, you can leave a space after the metal's name before you do your Roman numerals. Again, I'm not really going to be too picky on those since this is just first year chemistry, but I did want to just clarify that these are still separate um, compound words. So far, the compounds we've named have been binary ionic compounds. But what about compounds made up of more than two elements? You'll learn about naming these compounds next. Ternary compounds are compounds made up of three elements. They usually consist of a metallic cation and a polyatomic anion. The only common polyatomic ion having a positive charge is the ammonium ion. When naming these compounds, simply name the cation first, followed by the name of the polyatomic ion. In ternary compounds, don't change the ending of the polyatomic ion. Let's try naming a ternary ionic compound. What would be the name of the compound Na2SO4? You know that Na is the symbol for sodium. But what does SO4 represent? If you don't know, it's time to look at your charge chart. I'll give you a hint. Look under the column for ions with a negative 2 charge. Do you see it now? SO4 represents the sulfate ion. The name of the compound, represented by the chemical formula Na2SO4, is sodium sulfate. Believe it or not, you'll start to memorize lots of these ions, along with their charges, simply because you use them so often. That is why I'm testing this theory this year, is to see how well we do with learning our ion names without having separate testing to see how well your memorization is going. So, you will learn my guinea pigs this year. Now it's your turn to try one all on your own. What would be the name of a compound with the chemical formula FeCrO4? Here's a hint. Fe is one of those metals that can have more than one charge. The name of the compound FeCrO4 is iron 2 chromate. I hope you were able to figure out the name of FeCrO4. If not, let's watch as our student works through the process. In the formula FeCrO4, I know that Fe is a symbol for iron, and using a charge chart, I see that CrO4 is a polyatomic chromate ion. But when I look on my charge chart, I see that iron can form an ion with a charge of positive 2 or positive 3. I'll need Roman numerals in parentheses after the iron to denote which iron ion is present. I also know that the net charge on an ionic compound must be zero. So by looking at the chromate ion, CrO4, on my charge chart, I find that it has a charge of negative two. That means that the total positive charge of the formula must be positive two. Since I only have one iron ion in the formula, its charge must be positive two. The name of the compound is iron 2 chromate. So remember, when you don't have those parentheses around your polyatomic ion, you don't need them because you only have one of them. And that one is understood. We do not have to write it. So just to recap, you don't need to know the difference between binary and ternary ionic compounds. I just want you to know um, you're going to name them the same way. The difference is monatomic anions get the ending IDE, polyatomic ions are going to keep whatever their name ending is. Now in your notes, we actually talk about the difference between those eight and ite endings, and we talk about some prefixes that you are going to see in those as well. So you might want to check your textbook for information on those. Here's a hint. We're talking about oxyanions because they have the element oxygen in them. Do some reading on oxyanions in our textbook um, to help you fill out what should be the last section 
of these notes. If you are missing anything, I do have slides posted in Google Classroom, but I would really like you all to practice using these videos and figuring out how to extrapolate the information that needs to go in these blanks and these notes by yourselves, because that is a very important skill to have. And you learn more that way than just by copying down the information. I cannot wait to see you all on Friday. Don't forget to wish our girls cross country team good luck. They've got semi-state and they will not be here on Friday. Um, so until I see you all again, my darlings, I am available by email if you have some questions. Good luck on the handout. Bye-bye.